Good, so, uh, so a little bit of um, background on me. Uh, my name is Brian Vogelsang. I work in Qualcomm's XR business. Uh, at, in the XR business, we uh, sit within Qualcomm's mobile business unit, so the same group that makes silicon for our smartphones. And, but we're laser focused on, uh, on XR, so augmented and virtual reality devices. Our, our customers are primarily OEMs. So we work with the folks who are building commercial hardware for augmented and virtual reality. We build, we uh, provide them the engine, sort of the chipset that powers those devices. And we also provide them software that um, help enable experiences, immersive experiences on those devices. So in the virtual reality space, you may be familiar with um, you know, devices like the Oculus Quest or the Oculus Go, the HTC Vive Focus, or the Lenovo Mirage Solo, or Pico's Neo 2. These are devices that are powered by Qualcomm's Snapdragon. And then uh, we also work on the augmented reality side. Uh, companies who are building products like, uh, like Vuzix or uh, Realware or uh, Google Glass Enterprise Edition or um, HoloLens 2. Those are all uh, Qualcomm uh, powered products. So here today to talk with you a little bit about um, the intersection of three areas. One is uh, uh, 5G, the other is augmented reality, and the other is enterprise. So, uh, so excited to be here today. So if we look at uh, Qualcomm and its history, we've really spent the last 30 years um, really transforming how the world uh, connects, uh, computes, and communicates. So that started er in the early days with the transition from 1 to 2G and analog to digital. So we helped the world go digital. Then we uh, took technology and we built processor capability to go along with that connectivity. And that became what uh, feature phones and ultimately smartphones. And those um, building smartphones and the chipsets that power those sort of developed this mobile revolution that became the largest uh, technology platform on the planet. And now we're taking that technology that we developed for mobile and we're bringing that into new industries. So every, everywhere from automotive to Internet of Things to XR. And so I'm here to talk a little bit about XR today. Now, um, <clears throat> if we look at the past a little bit, about every 10 years the mobile industry goes through a, um, a transformation, a new technology gets introduced. So back in the, in the late 90s, we had the move from 1G to, 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 to digital, to 2G. And with that, we really, it was really the benefit for the operator. They got um, more capacity, more efficiency on their network. Yeah, you got less dropped calls and, um, and a better voice quality, but it didn't, wasn't meaningful in terms of, of data. But then in, um, in the, the late 90s, early 2000s, we introduced uh, as an industry, 3G technology. Then you started seeing feature phones get data access. We had WAP browsers, we had Java, J2ME, app stores emerged. We saw devices like the BlackBerry come in, into play, uh, uh, products from Microsoft and others that enabled you know, early smartphone markets. And that's where things really got going with, with data. And then, of course, in uh, uh, the, the late uh, 2000s, 2010, we saw the emergence of 4G. This coincided with processing capability that Qualcomm helped drive that enabled you know, gigahertz class performance in processors. That, and, and that, coinciding with uh, you know, connectivity and, and mobile broadband, enabled the smartphone revolution. So this is really um, the, the uh, and Qualcomm's been a s significant part of driving this evolution in mobile. And our inventions are what are powering that. So now we're moving on to the next generation. Uh, it, we're now introducing the world to, to 5G. And you know, 5G is a, a significant step. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how, uh, what it means to have 5G. And then I'm also going to tie that into how, how 5G and augmented reality are going to work together in an enterprise setting. So first, I want to start off with uh, a little bit of background on 5G. It's, it's here today. So if we look at 5G, you know, Verizon uh, announced in April that they're launching two cities. I think they're, they're going to launch another 28 cities by the end of the year. In Europe, I was at, uh, in Switzerland, in Zurich uh, in April. They launched their first 5G network there, brought uh, a number of phones online uh, last week. BTEE in the UK launched their, uh, announced their 5G network. It's actually being turned on tomorrow in six cities. In South Korea, uh, uh, KT launched its network, its 5G network. And we have a number of other operators that are planning launches in uh, the other countries you see here, uh, Australia, Japan, China this year. So to give a little more context on that, in comparing 4G to 5G, so when we launched 4G the, in the first year, 
uh, there were four operators and three handsets. And so Qualcomm as an ecosystem enabler helped work with these OEMs, work with the operators to bring uh, 5G to market. With 5G, we're launching over 20 operators and over 20 OEMs concurrently. So you can see that there's a tremendous momentum behind this operator and OEM ecosystem. The whole ecosystem has come together to really make 5G a success. And the pace of innovation is moving much more quickly than it has in previous generations. All right, Let's see if I can get that forward, all right. So what is 5G? Really, 5G is, uh, at its core, it's a, it's a more capable five air interface. So the air interface is the technology that uses the mobile spectrum for the device to communicate with the network. But what, why is 5G better and, and why is it more important? Well, um, you know, you can see across the bottom here, it affords a number of really great new capabilities. It's a more efficient way of, it's more spectrally efficient, so it's using the existing spectrum that it has. You can increase the capacity, you can increase the density of people that are going to be using the network. So when we get into industri in IoT situations, or even augmented reality, where you've got lots of people, like if, if, if everyone in this room were, were augmented with glasses, that would be a really high throughput, uh, dense, group of people trying to access services concurrently. Uh, these are all gonna be enabled through 5G. Also, there's much more capacity there, just in general. The spectrum that we're using is, uh, particularly in these high bands, has, has more capacity. And this means more throughput. And then, particularly important to XR is the fact that 5G affords lower latency, 10 times lower latency than previous generations. And we're in a release 15 of, of 5G. There will be a release 16, and there'll be even newer and more enhancements to latency, which will reduce that. So, uh, so that's kind of mobile broadband. What, what, is, what, what is it about the spectrum? Well, it, in previous generations, the, uh, the technology used primarily the mid-bands, 4G used primarily mid-bands. In 5G, we've introduced capability to support both the low bands, sub gigahertz. This could be for IoT applications like really low power um, ac actuators or sensors that need to transmit data um, infrequently to, uh, to mid-bands. And then also these high bands. The high bands, these are 24 gigahertz and above, are where you're really gonna see this, these you know, tremendous new uh, enhancements to the throughput, the latency, et cetera. So 5G supports a very, very diverse spectrum, and there's a lot of work hap that happened in the standards bodies to make, to make that possible technologically. Also, the deployments can be very diverse in 5G. So you can deploy a macro network, like a mobile network operator does, uh, where they cover a, a region or a metropol metropolitan area. You can deploy a, an enterprise use case in, in a, a regional space. You're a wind, wind turbine or wind farm or you're a, let's say, a port. You want to cover that area. Or you can just deploy a 5G in an enterprise using small cells. So this would be, um, could be public. So public would be pro provided by an operator or private where the enterprise deployed their own infrastructure or worked with a third party to help them deploy uh, the infrastructure is similar to the way they, they deploy Wi-Fi today. So we'll, and I'll talk more about private, private and public uh, 5G because I think it's, it's important for enterprise use case. So I talked about sub-6 as bit previously where most of 4G had operated. 5G is also going to be in, in, in sub-6, so the launches that are happening, for instance, in Europe, the auctions haven't occurred yet on the millimeter wave side in many of the parts of, uh, parts of Europe, for example. So the regulators are going to have to go through that process. In the meantime, they're launching in the 3.5 gigahertz spectrum. Um, this is a uh, spectrum that, that in the United States is used by um, <clears throat> an organization called CBRS, it's the Citizens Broadband Radio Service. This, pre it, this, this spectrum had previously been used to, uh, for aircraft carriers for takeoff and landing by the U.S. military. It's about 500 megahertz uh, spectrum. That's been uh, cleared with the U.S. military now to be used as shared spectrum, so you can operate private networks in it. Initially, it's been 4G networks through the CBRS Alliance. Now the CBRS Alliance is looking at how do we bring 5G to this. This is important for enterprises because they, they may want to deploy their own private networks using this, uh, it's called shared spectrum. And then, of course, we have the, the, the vast amount of the bandwidth for 5G, which comes from 20, over 25 times more than what's used in 3G and 4G today, which comes from these really high millimeter wave bands. But millimeter wave has shorter range, and it doesn't penetrate as well through, through, uh, um, through, through bodies or, or walls and that sort of thing. So you have to have a denser, a denser network. Now, let's talk about how does this relate to uh, augmented reality glasses. So, uh, ultimately, where we want to be 
is, is standalone augmented reality glasses using 5G. So we want an all-in-one glass that we can put on that will, um, that will have 5G connectivity. But that's gonna take a little bit of time and there are gonna be some steps that we're gonna move through along the way, starting now with wire tethered to a smartphone. So you may have seen around the conference uh, today, there's a variety of companies that are talking about this. Qualcomm is enabling this ecosystem, which I'll share more about. But essentially you take a glass, an augmented or a virtual reality glass, you tether it over USB-C to a smartphone. And the 5G smartphone is what does the processing, and the 5G smartphone is what provides the connectivity. This is how you can get 5G with augmented reality experiences today. That's gonna evolve. If you have, uh, let's say, special purpose enterprise applications that don't want to use the smartphone, that'll evolve to a uh, puck or uh, a tethered um, accessory that can be connected to the glass, again, over USB, that can provide the 5G connectivity. So OEMs can get commercial modules, which are certified, that support 5G, they can add them to like a Snapdragon processor in their puck, and now they can connect that um, over a wire to the headset, to the glass. Then we're going to see another transition to wireless. Um, let's see if this. So this wireless is tethered to either the smartphone or the puck, but it's it's using again millimeter wave technology, but at a higher band, uh, 60 gigahertz, which is, there are standards in this in, 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 through Wi-Fi called 8211 um, AX and, or uh, AD and AY. The um, this is important because it's cable replacement technology. So now you can replace that, that USB. Now, why can't I just use Bluetooth or something like that? For the same reason you, you can't connect you know, your monitor to your PC or your, or your TV to your, um, to your um, you know, Apple TV without having a cable. It's high, high bandwidth. If you want to be able to push like 4K video um, out to the displays, because in augmented reality, you've got stereoscopic dual displays, so you have to feed high resolution video to each one of those. You need a really, really fast and low latency short, short range wireless connection. Now, um, <clears throat> you're also feeding information in from your augmented reality glasses because they're doing spatial mapping, they're doing head tracking, they're doing other things. That's typically taking video information and processing it and that, um, those video images have to be moved to the, the device that's doing the computing you know, wirelessly or over USB, extremely low latency and, and high speed. So this is kind of, this is how the, the, we as Qualcomm see this, um, this uh, market evolving in the, uh, in the next few years with 5G. Try this again. I don't know if you guys in the back can help me fast forward here. It's not uh, forwarding. Oh, here we go. All right, so that first step, Qualcomm is enabling this today. So when we talk about wiring the glasses to the smartphone, at Mobile World Congress in February, we announced a, uh, we did an ecosystem announcement and uh, did an, uh, a, a, a collaboration where, which included smartphone OEMs, it included operators, platform providers. This is where we, uh, we take what we call viewers. So viewers are uh, our glasses, either augmented or virtual reality. They can tether to the smartphone, and we provide the, the, t the technology that helps enable the smartphone to power those glasses. Now, this allows you to have, do a couple things. One, you can have more lightweight uh, designs, more comfortable designs, because you're moving the processing off of the glasses to the, to the smartphone. You're moving the battery off the glasses to the smartphone. Now you can get a pair of augmented reality glasses that are under 100 grams, which starts to become interesting from a uh, usability perspective for long periods of time. And it enables the glasses to tether and get 5G connect connectivity right away. We also are enabling more immersive experiences with these types of glasses, so stereo displays, so being able to have multiple displays, each at high resolution, 1080p and, uh, and greater. Uh, head tracking, so being able to, if you want to be able to um, position a virtual object in, in an environment and be able to walk around that or move closer to it, you need six degree of freedom movement. This is something that like HoloLens has or, or Magic Leap has. If you want to be able to do that with this kind of a tethered uh, experience, you need head tracking. And then things like controllers or spatial audio, other things to drive immersion into the experience so it feels, you know, um, much more um, much more like the things you're working with are natural and real. And this is all enabled with our new premium tier chipset, the Snapdragon 855. So 855 is a smartphone focused chipset. 
It's, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the phones that it's in. But this, uh, one of the things Qualcomm did was we shipped the technology to power these XR experiences in the software that, uh, and, and the hardware that we shipped to the OEMs, the smartphone manufacturers. So it's, ready, it's already there. And then we built an optimized program that allows a viewer OEM, if I, if I make a viewer an OEM and I want to be pair or be compatible with a smartphone, I can, I can do that. So, uh, so that's a program that we announced at Mobile World Congress. And an example of that is that uh, uh, an OEM, a customer of ours that's doing this uh, architecture is Enreal. So you've probably seen the light product from Enreal. It's, uh, it's tethered to a puck. It can be tethered to a Snapdragon 845 puck or to a 5G smartphone. And this is a, a, a really nice product. It's got a 52 degree field of view. It's got uh, a six degree of freedom head tracking. It's got uh, 1080p, really high quality. Um, great displays. So and this is one example. You can see them. Uh, they're on the show floor tomorrow. We have them in our booth as well. And I uh, would encourage you to go take a look at the experiences here around enterprise. And then another is the Epson, the Moverio BT30C. This is another example of a device. This one's a 3 doff device, so it doesn't have the stereo, uh, the, the stereo cameras for head tracking. Um, and it, but it's also high resolution, 720p, and plugs into, uh, to, plugs into smartphones. Okay, what smartphones? Uh, well, Qualcomm, uh, this is an, a little bit of an old data point here, but um, it, it's the one that, I, that I'm approved to show, and it's uh, 30 plus devices that were enabled as of Mobile World Congress with, um, with our, our, uh, our Snapdragon processor that's capable of supporting these kinds of X XR experiences. So devices from LG, Motorola, uh, Samsung, Xiaomi, ZTE, um, uh, ones that are up, uh, not up here, we have um, an, uh, one that, the one that we launched with um, in Switzerland was Oppo, and that was we did a demonstration there tethered to in real glasses. So enterprise, uh, why does enterprise? Why is an enterprise going to want to have this uh, m you know 5G millimeter wave technology? Well, one is uh, is just the high speed, low latency that I talked about before, but also the ability to deploy these indoor private networks to be able to service their, uh, their machines and including their augmented workforce through, um, th through this high speed you know, uh, technology, wireless technology. And what, what are private, private 5G networks? What, are they, what do they look like? So they're, um, they're optimized, so they're tailored at, for industrial use cases. So if I'm a, a discrete manufacturing facility or I'm a port or I am a, a warehouse, a logistical hub. I want to be able to tune maybe my augmented reality experience at a higher quality of service and a lower latency than other things that are happening on the factory floor. Uh, I want it to be dedicated and easy to deploy, so you as an enterprise could deploy this network, or you could work with an operator to uh, pro you know, receive services from them. And then, you know, cellular, tremendous amount of work goes into security. We've got billions of people on the planet on mobile networks uh, that, are, that are, have secure connections because of the robustness of the security in cellular, and that's maintained as we get to, uh, as to private networks. Uh, in the future, you know, we'll see a, 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 you know, a, a couple different flavors of these networks being deployed. One is an integrated network. This is where the devices and the network infrastructure, the access points, uh, for 5G access points, for lack of a better term, um, sit behind the firewall and are owned and operated by the enterprise. And then they, uh, the control plane, the thing that does authentication and roaming and that sort of thing, could come from a third party, maybe a, a multi-tenant hosted service provider that enables that. Or you could put it all in the network and have the enterprise run the whole thing privately and have their augmented reality experiences or their other in, uh, in industrial experiences running over, over 5G independently. Okay, we'll see if the next one plays because it's got a video. There we go. So example would be a factory, a factory of the future. In, uh, in this case, you know, you've got a, uh, uh, let's say a robotic arm. That robotic arm might be mobile. You might have a reconfigurable factory that changes based upon um, things that need to get manufactured that day. So that means that infrastructure needs to be moved around. So connecting that over a low latency 5G connection is really important. You may have augmented workers who are you know, wearing augmented reality glass in that factory that need to work in tandem with the robotics and together with the robotics in, in, in through a task. 
And so you need extreme low latency for safety reasons. So you, know, the, the, you need localization and mapping from the headset to inform the robotics about where the, where the person is who's in, in the room. And then you need you know, the cameras and other things to be able to de de detect um, when you're getting into, let's say, a boundary area that, that where the, there could, the, the person could be at risk of injury. So you know, connecting the augmented reality glasses in the factory of the future, connecting the infrastructure like the robotic arm or autonomous vehicles or other sensors or actuators that happen to live in that factory can all be enabled through, uh, through 5G networks. Now, this is, um, this is a, an example of, of coverage, because sometimes we get questions, well, what if I deploy a 5G network uh, alongside, let's say, a Wi-Fi network? Am I going to have to deploy more 5G because millimeter wave you know, needs more density? This was an example. This is a simulation at Qualcomm. This is our headquarters building here. And you can see we simulated 20 sites of Wi-Fi against 14 sites of 5G millimeter wave. And, um, and you can see the, the uplink coverage, so the coverage area getting you know, virtually 99% coverage um, on 14 sites versus you know, 20, 20 sites, and then the downlink burst rate almost uh, uh, equivalent. So this is an example of how you know, it can be economical as well to deploy uh, 5G. Now, the last topic I want to spend a little bit of time talking about is, um, is distributed intelligence. So one of the things that's great about uh, about 5G networks is that low latency capability. But if, I have, if my application has to go all the way to some cloud infrastructure, I may add a bunch of latency there that my application can't handle. So what if we took the, took the infrastructure and we brought it closer to the edge? And this is represented here as something called an edge cloud. But essentially, it's infrastructure that lives closer to where the augmented reality glasses are. So if um, it might be on the premises, or it might be in the same metro metropolitan area if an operator was, was offering this, sometimes referred to in our industry as mobile edge compute. And now I can take some of the processing that I would normally do on the glasses, and I can move that off to this infrastructure. So let's say I want to render a really high resolution CAD design, 3D CAD design on a, on a table in a conference room. And I, but I don't have enough horsepower. I want to render that with 300 watts of GPU. I only have five watts of GPU or two watts of GPU on my, on my glasses. I can use the mobile edge compute to offload that. Now, if I also want a sixth off experience where I move around it as I'm moving around that 3D object, uh, I need the graphics to be able to update as I'm moving, and they need to be rendered by the edge cloud. So you know, Qualcomm has a technology we call this boundless XR. Uh, we have a variant of it for, for P PCs, for 11 AD, inside, inside someone's home. Uh, we also have a variant of it that works over 5G. What this does is uh, when, I, when my head is looking at something, I, um, and I'm in a specific orientation, it sends that head pose data up to, the, up to a server, a mobile edge server, that then computes a stream of data that represents that, that 3D object. And then once that data stream comes back, uh, there's some ca uh, calculation that's done kind of just in time for any change that my head made while that, that 3D was being rendered, 3D object was being rendered, let's say, in the, in the edge cloud. And so it makes up for the fact that my head might have moved you know, a few millimeters when I, when it, by the time I received that, that back. And so that technology is going to enable the, um, some, you know, me to offload and provide really higher end experiences through uh, mobile edge compute. Now, example of this, um, we, have a, we have a partner. The partner is a, a company called Arvizio. They, are, they have a product called MR Studio, and that product is, does, uses, uh, renders complex 3D models and, or like big LiDAR point clouds. This is a 400 million LiDAR point cloud of a factory that was taken. If you want to render that in augmented reality and want to be able to walk through that factory, or you know they work in architectural engineering and construction, energy and utilities, other, other businesses where you could be rendering different types of objects, you want to be able to do that on a lighter weight uh, glass, you can use a mobile edge compute and essentially an edge-based GPU to do that rendering and then low latency stream that over 5G back to the glasses, either through the smartphone or through the puck. And so this is something that we've, um, we've demonstrated with our Vizio and, uh, and Real on uh, Snapdragon you know, 5G-based devices. So I think uh, I've got 38 seconds left before <laughs> questions. Uh, just to summarize, 5G is here. It's here today. XR viewers are how you can deploy 5G with augmented reality today. 
the, um, these can be deployed on public 5G networks from operators or private 5G networks with enterprises in the future. And mobile edge compute is going to be a technology that's going to enable even you know, more immersive experiences, leveraging the low latency benefits of 5G. Thank <laughs> you.